Thank you for taking the time to watch this message. Gospel Light is a place where the Bible is preached and people are loved. If this message encourages you, please send an email to glbcbr at hotmail.com and let us know how you were helped. Thank you again for watching. Now let's get ready to grow through God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. We're going to be covering verses 1 through 10. But for our scripture reading tonight, we're just going to read two verses, and that is verses 9 and 10. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse number 9, it says, For I am the least of the apostles, that am not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now just let that sit and think for a moment. Ponder in your mind who's writing this under the inspiration of God. Who's the author of 1 Corinthians? Say it with me, church. Paul. And his expression here in verse 9, For I am the least of the apostles, that am not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Verse 10, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Let's say that expression, church. Ready? Begin. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. He goes on to say in verse 10, And His grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet, not I, but the grace of God, which was given, or which was, excuse me, with me. I'd like to bring a message that I've entitled, Total Transformation and an idea of the resurrection and renovating that in our lives and allowing the resurrection to transform transform us in our perspective. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for this time in your word. And Lord, we're thankful tonight that we have the inerrant, infallible, inspired, and preserved word of God. Lord, we're thankful tonight uh, that your word is truth. As your word says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We're thankful that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And Lord, it's all profitable for doctrine and for reproof and for correction and for instruction in righteousness, so much so that we would be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And Lord, you have a, a group, a host of people here tonight uh, that have come to hear the word of God preached. They've not come uh, to hear a man, they've come to hear from you. And God, I ask and pray only by your spirit that you would touch each and every heart as only you can. And Lord, maybe there's a heart tonight Uh, that needs some healing. There's a heart that uh, tonight needs some encouragement. There's a heart tonight that needs instruction. There's a heart tonight uh, that needs correction. Lord, there's uh, uh, perhaps a heart tonight that uh, does not know the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, what a night it would be uh, for them to place their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless our time as only you can. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, thank you so much. You may be seated. Well, of course, we are in our study through 1 Corinthians chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Uh, We have now come to chapter number 15, and uh, we have one more chapter, uh, and then we'll be completed through the book of 1 Corinthians. And uh, as we've studied, we now find ourselves here in chapter number 15, and we referenced it, matter of fact, this morning in our message when we were focusing on uh, the gospel, and we'll be addressing that tonight. Uh, But we saw in chapters 12 through 14, Paul begins to really uh, bring the whole scope and the usage and the operation, the functions of the spiritual gifts when it comes to the local New Testament church. And if you were in our study last week, you understood that there were really threefold purposes when it comes to your spiritual gifts and my spiritual gift when it comes to the local New Testament church. Paul says you need to use your gift to edify the body of Christ. How many of you were thankful tonight for a piano player being able to play the piano? And all God's people said... And you know what? The purpose of him using that gift was not to uh, bring exaltation to himself. Uh, It was to bring exaltation for us to bring worship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the second truth that we thought of and brought uh, uh, out in uh, 1 Corinthians 14 was the idea of understanding. And when it came to the usage of tongues within this church, they were speaking in unknown tongues and there was no understanding being brought to those people. And so Paul says, hey, I would rather preach and I would rather preach five words in my understanding than a thousand different words in an unknown tongue. And that just goes to show you, church, that you ought to value the words that you say out of your mouth. And uh, so anyway, he uses the expression of edification. He uses the expression of understanding. And then I want you to look back at 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40, where he closes out the chapter 
And he says, let all things be done, what church? Decently and in order. Now what you're going to find is in chapter number 15, a whole different tone. You're going to find a whole different direction really from that which you see in chapters 12, 13, and 14 on spiritual gifts. And you're going to see him correct a very important truth that was under attack in Corinth. Uh, But you will uh, uh, probably all acknowledge tonight that this truth is under attack even in our country today. And he will explain the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, You see in Corinth, which was predominantly a Greek city, they didn't believe uh, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And matter of fact, when Paul, if you go back to the book of Acts in chapter number 17, Paul was preaching at Athens. I want you to take your Bible and see it. Go to Acts chapter number 17. In verse number 32, because when Paul was in Athens, he was declaring the fact that Jesus Christ was indeed the Son of God and that he had a bodily resurrection. And what you're going to find as Paul is preaching this truth in Acts 17, uh, you will find that there were listeners that actually mocked, actually scoffed at the fact uh, of the possibility of a person by the name of Jesus Christ to have a bodily resurrection. And he says in Acts chapter number 17, verse number 32, he says, And when they heard of the, say the next word, church, resurrection, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, what does the next two words say, church? Ready? Begin. Some mocked. And then Bible says, and others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. And so, uh, understand that the Grecians, the Greek city there in Corinth, they had a skeptical attitude when it came to the resurrection of Christ. Now take your Bible back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You will find that the, the area, that region was very skeptical and uh, uh, denying the uh, uh, acknowledgement of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that reality or that truth or that idea was not just something that was of the city of Corinth and the Grecian region. It was in fact being crept into the church there in Corinth. And so Paul feels it necessary. Matter of fact, he feels it imperative to defend the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many understand tonight that the issue of the resurrection of Jesus Christ was not just then in Corinth at that time? How many of you believe today that we're living in a time where there are various religions that deny the existence of an actual bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? And the truth of the matter is, is Paul says, hey, I need to take time to defend this truth. Uh, There are those various religions that would reject the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This ought to put a smile on your face. Aren't you thankful that you serve a risen Savior tonight? We serve a risen Savior, and I'm thankful for that. Because the truth is this, listen to me. Without the resurrection, Jesus would just be like all other religions. Uh, You think of Muhammad, you think of uh, Buddha, you think of all these various religions where they had a a teacher, a prophet, a God that eventually died and never resurrected. I'm just telling you, you have the greatest truth in all the world. Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and risen. And so it's a wonderful truth. It's a marvelous truth because Jesus isn't just one of the religions. He's the only way to heaven. The Bible says in John 14, verse 6, many of us know it, Jesus saith unto him, I am what, church? I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible goes on to say, no man cometh unto the Father, but what? By me. Uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If you're listening to me tonight, listen to this truth. The fact that you serve a risen Savior ought to give you joy tonight. The fact that you serve a risen Savior ought to give you hope. It ought to give you peace. The fact that you serve a risen Savior, listen to me, it ought to do something inside of you to transform you. It ought to change how you view your Christian walk. How you view yourself as a child of God. And so tonight... I just want to give you three simple thoughts about when you have a true understanding of the resurrection, there is first, number one, there is a transformed sense of yourself. 
When you have an understanding of what Jesus Christ did when He died on the cross, taking all the punishment, all the sin of mankind, and that He was buried and that He rose again, and that you and I, as a result of receiving His free gift of salvation by grace through faith, plus or minus nothing in all God's people said, uh, we can have a relationship with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, but what it should do is it should transform the way you think. Now, how many would agree with me, and this is just your opinion tonight, how many would agree with me that the Apostle Paul, other than the Lord Jesus Christ, was one of the greatest individuals used to advance the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? We would all say, hey, Paul, he was the best. Paul, he was the greatest. Many of us would uh, maybe perhaps uh, uh, look at another individual of some kind like the Apostle Paul, but I want you to see what Paul says about himself as a result of receiving The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You read it tonight with me. Look at verse number 9. Paul's perspective. After all these wonderful things he's done. Verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles. Let's say that expression, church. Ready? Begin. For I am the least of the apostles. We clearly know tonight that salvation isn't any other way. It's by the Lord Jesus Christ. And what that truth should do for you and I is it ought to transform us. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a what? He is a new creature. That means you ought to begin to change your mind. You ought to begin to change your actions. You ought to begin to change your walk. Uh, It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean you're going to be complete 180. But it means that you should begin the process of transforming your mind because salvation is by Jesus Christ. It is His resurrecting power. How many understand salvation is not in a pastor? Salvation is not in your church membership. Salvation is not in your family. I used to think that because my dad was a pastor, that means I'm saved. How many know that's the furthest thing from the truth? Uh, It is because of the grace of God. It is His death. It is His burial. It is His resurrection that brings the newness of life. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse number 4, the Bible says, Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, Even so, we also should what, church? If you know it, say it with me. Walk in newness of life. Now here, I'm going to give you three uh, uh, words here to think about. One of the greatest things about salvation is salvation is inclusive. Let's say that word together, church. Ready? Inclusive. Say it one more time. Inclusive. You know what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 13? For whosoever. How many are thankful that God is willing that all should come to repentance? He is willing. He's not willing that any should perish. It's inclusive. Salvation is for all. But how many understand the gospel is exclusive as well? The Bible says in John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus, again, I am what, church? The way the truth, and the life. What does it say? No man cometh unto the Father, what? But by me. The only way you and I can receive eternal life and receive a home in heaven is exclusively through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So salvation is inclusive. It's for whosoever. It's exclusive specifically to Jesus Christ. But salvation, one of the greatest things, is it's conclusive. When you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, how many understand you got saved? You got born again. How many of you believe we are saved for all of eternity? Uh, We did not lose our salvation. We didn't even earn it, so how can we lose it? Uh, And so the truth is, is that it's conclusive that we are saved. And so when someone trusts Christ, it ought to bring a new perspective of how you look at yourself. How many of you understand that before you met Jesus Christ, we were all on our way to a place called what? Hell. Every single one of us. How many understand tonight, even though we're saved, we all deserve it? We all deserve hell. We all deserve that. Because we're what? We're sinners. But the fact that we no longer have to face the penalty of sin, we have a power to overcome sin, we won't be in the presence of sin. How many are looking forward to that day? Uh, The truth is, is that it should change how you view yourself. Let me ask you this. This is a sarcastic question, but is it possible for a Christian to have a lofty view of self? And yet, the truth is, is we should have a lowly view of self. Look what, again, look at verse 9. He says, For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church 
of God. He says, I am the least of the apostles. Now, I want to bring you to just a wonderful truth that the Lord has been able to show me. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. We just read it. He says, for I am the least of the apostles. Again, let's say that one more time, church. Ready? Begin. For I am the least of the apostles. Now listen to this. The reason Paul uses that expression, and we'll look at a couple more here, is because as you walk with the resurrected Christ, you will see how holy He is and how unholy you and I are. You will see how worthy Jesus is and you will see how unworthy you and I all are. The truth that changed Paul was a sense of himself. He didn't say, yeah, I'm the greatest apostle. Yeah, I wrote this epistle. Yeah, I wrote this epistle. He says, for I am the least of the apostles. Now, chronologically, follow me here, 1 Corinthians was written roughly around 57 AD. I want you to take your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 3. Ephesians chapter number 3, because you will find that the book of Ephesians was written five years later in 62 AD. You will see in Ephesians chapter number 3, look at the Bible, Ephesians chapter number 3, and you'll see as, as, as Paul walks with God, his perspective of himself changes even more. And it's not for the worse, but rather it is for the better. So we just read in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 9, he says, For I am the least of the apostles. Now, how many apostles were there? Or disciples, let's just say it that way. There were 12, right? So he says, hey, I'm the least of those followers of Christ. I'm at least in the top 12, but I'm the least of that. Now look what he says in Ephesians chapter 3, and look at verse number 7 and verse number 8. He says, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Now listen to this. Unto me, let's say it all the way to the next comma, church. Ready? Begin. Who am less than the least of all saints. Did you catch that? He just said, hey, I'm the least of the apostles five years ago. And then five years later, as he walks with God and finds out, boy, I need Christ every single day. Boy, I need Christ every single day. Boy, I need Christ every single day. He realizes, you know what? I'm not even the least of the apostles. I'm the least of all saints. Matter of fact, he says, who is the less than the least of all saints. Now you just try to wrap your mind around that perspective, but it's a humbling position that Paul goes to. And it says, is this grace given, verse number eight, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so in 1 Corinthians, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. And then he says in Ephesians five years later, the less than the least of all. How many of you see that tonight? Would you raise your hand? So you see the progression here. Now, uh, when you see the true sense of God's grace, it will change you and I in a humbling way. Then you will find, now take your Bibles to the other expression that we see here, and that is in 1 Timothy chapter number 1. 1 Timothy chapter number 1, which many scholars believe was written two years after the book of Ephesians. This is really his second to last epistle. His final epistles was uh, uh, 2 Timothy. And uh, you will find in 1, number, or, uh, 1 Timothy... Look at chapter 1 and verse 15. Because he says, I'm the least of the apostles. Then he says, I am less than the least of all saints. And then he goes into 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 15. He says, And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which was in Christ Jesus. How many are you thankful for the exceeding grace of God tonight? The Bible goes on to say, This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save, what does it say, church? Sinners. And then what does it finish with? Of whom I am. Look at that perspective. He goes, hey, I'm, I'm the least of the apostles. And he says, hey, I'm the less than the least of all saints. And then at the end of his life, he says, hey, all those sinners that, that Jesus Christ died for, I'm the chief. I'm the worst, I'm the worst, I'm the worst. And I'm just telling you tonight, the more we understand the resurrected Christ, the more you and I will see how low we truly are and how much we need His power every single day. Think about it this way. Isaiah, take your Bible to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, even in the Old Testament, there were prophets that were used of the Lord in a great way, yet they had a, a, a lower humbling view of self. 
In Isaiah chapter 6, many of us know this account where Isaiah sees the presence of the Shekinah glory of the Lord in the temple. And he says in Isaiah chapter 6, look at verse number 5. After the account where he sees the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filmed the temple, uh, and the uh, angels cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Look at verse number 5. Look what Isaiah says following his, his encounter with the Lord. He says, then said I, let's say the next three words, church, woe is me. Let's say that one more time, church. Woe is me. He sees his perspective of who he truly is in comparison to the Lord. Hey, see, here's what, here's what I'm saying. The further you are from Christ, the more lofty view of yourself you'll have. The closer you are to Christ, the more lowly view of yourself you will have. As we draw close to Christ, we will realize how much more unworthy we are, how much uh, unholy we are, but by the grace of God, we have His righteousness that is robed on every single one of us. You go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Think about it this way. What was Paul's former name? Anybody know? Saul. The word Saul carries the idea of notoriety carries the idea of somebody. How many understand Saul was a great leader and persecutor of the church? And he was a big individual. Yet if you study his name of Paul, it means small, little. thought about that for a moment. And I wrote this in my notes. I've never met somebody who was too little to be used of God. But I have met a lot of people that were too big to be used of God. Think about that. I've never met somebody who was too little to be used of God. But I have met a whole lot of people that were too big, egotistical, wrong sense of self. And Paul has the sense of, I am the least of the apostles because his example was Jesus Christ. Take your Bible to Philippians chapter 2. I want you to see this. Philippians 2. Philippians chapter 2. It's okay we do a Bible study tonight. How many are you okay with that? Say amen. Philippians chapter 2. See, the thing is, is, is Paul, Paul is not the person that we follow. What did he say in 1 Corinthians? Follow me as I follow who? Christ. So when Paul says, I'm the least of the apostles, when he says, I'm less than the least of all saints, when he says, I'm the chief of sinners... He's really bringing it to perspective of his example, who is Jesus Christ. In Philippians chapter 2, look at verses 5 through 8, if you would, please. Look what it says. It says in verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in, say the next two words, Christ Jesus. So here's the mentality that Paul is, is calling on the Philippians to have. And he says, Jesus Christ. Now look, who being in the form of who, church? God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So it, it wasn't that it, it was wrong for Jesus Christ to say He was God because how many understand Jesus Christ is God? But, look what it says in verse 6. I just scared some of you. <laughs> look at verse number 6. But made Himself of what, church? No reputation. And took upon Himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now I think I would speak for everybody here tonight when everybody would say, Pastor Scott, I want to be Christ-like. But it's one thing to say you want to be Christ-like. How many understand it's another thing to live to be Christ-like? Following the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about it this way, Christ-like. Christ knew every person the day He was crucified that would spit on Him. Yet He still loved them. Christ knows every single one of our next failures, yet He is quick to forgive. He's quick to cleanse us. Hey, I'm just telling you tonight that when it comes to the Gospel, when it comes to serving the resurrected Christ, we ought to have a transformed sense of who we truly are. Because for Paul, he says, I'm the least. Notice number two, not only would we have a transformed sense of self, but number two, we would have a transformed grasp of grace. 
we would have a transformed grasp of grace. Because look what he says. Go back to your Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 at our main text tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And look at verse number 10. Actually, we'll back up to get the full thought here in verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9. He says, For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And look what he says in verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Let, me. let me ask you a question here. Is it possible to be saved by God's grace and yet at the same time be completely numb and dead to the grace of God? How many would say tonight you're thankful for the grace of God? Would you say Amen. Well, grace, grace, we hear it all the time. Hey, it is only by His grace that you and I are not consumed. It is only by His grace that you have breath tonight. It is only by His grace that you have a family tonight in a church. It is only by His grace that you and I have eternal life. John Newton, the great hymn author, he wrote a marvelous song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace hath brought us safe thus far, and grace will lead us home. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Would you have a proper perspective of the truth of God's grace in your life? Paul marveled at the grace of God. When you're not walking with God, how many understand it's easy to forget about His grace? Listen to this expression. Look at verse 10. I want you to see this. He says, but by the grace of God, what does he say, church? Ready? Begin. I am what I am. Take your Bible to Exodus chapter 3. I want you to see something here. That expression, I am what I am. Take your Bible to Exodus chapter number 3. Exodus chapter number 3. You'll know that this is the account of uh, Moses in the burning bush. Exodus chapter number 3 and verse 13. Listen to this. He said, but by the grace of God... I am what I am. Look what Moses or what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 3 verse 13. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, say it with me church, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now follow me with this thought. The reason we are who we are today is because God was, God is, and God always will be who He says He will be. How many believe tonight He's always good? He's always good. He wasn't good in the past. He's good now, and He'll be good to you until the day of Jesus Christ. We are who we are today by the grace of God. That's why Paul says, I am what I am because of Jesus Christ being who He says He is. The reason you and I can say I'm saved and on my way to heaven is because of God and His promise to you of salvation. Because He has fulfilled that. He is who He says He is. Now I want you to think about this thought here. Take your Bible to Exodus chapter 34 now. Because I really really want you to see an Old Testament account of who God is. And you say, Pastor Scott, I really want to know who God is. I want to know His grace. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 5. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 5. The Bible says, And the Lord descended in the cloud... 
and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Listen to this. Keeping mercy for, what does it say, church? Thousands. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. I just marvel at the truth in verse number five and six where it says, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious long-suffering. You want to know who God is? He's merciful tonight. You want to know who God is? He's gracious tonight. He is long-suffering. He is abundant in goodness and truth. He has kept... How many understand He's kept mercy back? Or He's held mercy from, uh, 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 from you and I. He's held punishment back. He's been gracious and merciful. How many are thankful tonight He's forgiven you of all your iniquity? When we forget who God is, when we don't walk with Him, we can have a lofty view of ourselves. When we don't forget God, and when we walk with Him, we can have a lowly view of ourselves. Can I just ask you a question? Do you understand tonight, everything you have is because of God? Even my house, Pastor Scott? Even your house. My car, Pastor Scott? If it runs, yes. <laughs> Even if it doesn't run. (laughs) Thank you, brother. Your food, your family, your church, nothing you have tonight is by you. It is all by Jesus Christ. It's His grace. So listen to this thought. Because our God is so gracious, how many are a recipient of His grace tonight? Shouldn't it be easy to then be gracious to other people? But how many of us would say, I'm not as gracious as I need to be? That's a wrong view of self. The transformed sense of self. The transformed grasp of grace. Hey, listen, a person that is unforgiving, a person that's bitter, a person that is holding back and and not forgiving is a person that does not have a proper view of what grace is. Because there are probably more times than we can count where God could run thin on patience with us, but He doesn't. He's long-suffering. So there's the transformed sense of self. I am the least. There's the transformed grasp of grace. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And then notice finally as we close, number three, there is a transformed labor of love. And I want you to see this at the end of verse number 10. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Look what He says here. But I labored more abundantly than they all. And you say, well, now He's boasting. Well, look what He corrects it on here. He says, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. What does Paul say in Galatians? He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but who, church? Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by my power. No, he says, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. It is so consistent. You can see the consistency of Scripture of how Paul viewed himself. And he says in verse 10, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. When the Gospel and the resurrection grabs a hold of you and I, we're going to want to serve. Notice Paul, he didn't take credit for his labor of love as we just pointed out. He said, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. I want to close with this thought. You want to know why you and I should show an expression of our labor of love for other people? How many understand Jesus Christ did a pretty good job of displaying his love for all of us? Let me just give you a couple verses here. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7-11, through 11, the Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another... For love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is what, church? Love. 
And this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to what? Love one another. John 15 verse 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, than what? A man lay down his life for his friends. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God commendeth. Hey, that word commendeth means to demonstrate. I tell people this when I'm out knocking on doors. Uh, God commendeth the word demonstrate. I demonstrate my love to my wife by giving her a credit card and saying, go spend, and uh, don't tell me how much it was. <laughs> uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll demonstrate our love to our kids by getting them gifts. It seems like now our kids are in a habit of expecting a gift every time we come back from Walmart and Target, and I suppose that's our fault. (laughs) But demonstrating our love. God demonstrated His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, does that wrap your mind, does that compute in your mind that even when you were sinning, that never changed God's love for you? Wow. It's easy for us when somebody does something wrong to us to hold a grudge, isn't it? Aren't you thankful God doesn't hold those? He says, but God commendeth His love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And no, I didn't forget the greatest verse in all the Bible. John chapter 3, verse 16. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here's my, here's my question. How do you view yourself? You have a lofted view. You say, well, right now in this moment, God being here as our witness, I have a lowly view of self, but as soon as you walk outside those doors and you, you talk with people, you have a lofty view of self, Or do we tell people, hey, it is only by God's grace that I am alive, that I have everlasting life, and a home in heaven. Do you understand His grace? John Newton had a perfect rap on it by writing, Amazing Grace. Do you have an understanding of God's love? And how He labored for you and I? So here's my question. Have we, have we grown cold to God? How many you understand tonight, it is possible for people to be in church their entire life and be cold spiritually for the Lord. Bitterness will make you cold. Anger will make you cold. Hey, you could not have bitterness. You could not have anger. But if you don't read God's Word, you'll be cold. You don't have a prayer life. You'll be cold. I can tell you this, the more closer you are to Christ, the lower view you'll have of yourself. But it will motivate you to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where I got the title, Total Transformation. I pray that's a help to you tonight. Let's pray. Father, we love you.